Let's go to the book of Romans, the book of Reformation. This is a powerful book of Reformation. And the first thing it wants to reform is you and I. It wants to reform us. And from there, it will reform the church. And I believe that God is going to move powerfully in the church, universally in the world, and He's going to do it through an understanding of the revelation of what is within this book, the book of Romans. I title tonight's message, Farewell, My Beloved. You know, many people look at Paul and they, they see him harsh and strong uh, and uh, just kind of in your face sometimes, but you really need to understand what this man was facing, what he was trying to go through, and what he was trying to develop in the kingdom of God. He really had a father's heart. And when we look at the end of chapter 15 and chapter 16, this is basically his greetings to everybody through the letter and uh, summing things up and saying, hope to catch you in person in the future. And with that, you'll begin hearing just the love in his heart as a father over this congregation. And so I hope it brings a new dimension to you concerning Paul. So let's start at chapter 15 and start at verse 14 where we left off. And Paul says this, I myself am satisfied about you, my brothers, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge and able to instruct one another. But on some points I have written to you very boldly by way of reminder, because of the grace given me by God to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles in the priestly service of the gospel of God, so that the offering of the Gentiles may be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In Christ Jesus, then, I have reason to be proud of my work for God, for I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me to bring the Gentiles to obedience by word and deed, by the power of signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit, so that from Jerusalem and all the way around Elikum, I have fulfilled the ministry of the gospel of Christ, and thus I make it my ambition to preach the gospel, not where Christ has already been named, lest I build on someone else's foundation. But as it is written, those who have never been told of him will see, and those who have never heard will understand. So what Paul is saying is, look, at I, I know that I got a little heavy-handed with you. I know that in some points I had to press in, but it's because I know you know how to teach each other. You can instruct this. But the reason I'm doing it, and this is his apostolic fathering, is he said, because I want to present you to God, and I, and I want you to be refreshed and cleansed by the Holy Spirit. And he said, I've been called as an apostle to the Gentile world. So I'm not building on the Jewish believers in Jerusalem. I'm not building where Christ has been mentioned before. I'm going out into the places where, to the nations concerning this great commission where they've never heard Jesus before. And so in doing this, I'm coming with a boldness, with signs and wonders, with power from God, and it's my responsibility to God to go and to preach this gospel. And I know you can handle it. So that's his heart. That's Paul's mission. And he says, my job's done here. Let's go on. He goes this, verse 22. This is the reason why I have so often been hindered from coming to you. He had never been to Rome. He knows many of the brethren there, sisters there. He, he knows many of the people there. He's writing to them, but he's never been there. He wants to get there. But he's been hindered. But now, since I no longer have any room for work in these regions, and he's writing from Corinth. You remember Corinth, don't you? They believe there were three letters written to the Corinthian church. We have two of them. And uh, he's in Corinth now writing about to the churches in Rome. And he says, you know, his circuit on his third missionary journey, he got beat up, stoned. He got uh, put in jail and arrested and so forth. He, he, He realizes that preaching circuit, I don't know if he can make it again, but his goal is to get to Spain 
And on the way to Spain, he wants to come back to Rome. He wants to hit Rome first. But now, since I no longer have any room for work in these regions, and since I've longed for many years to come to you, I hope to see you in passing as I go to Spain and to be helped on my journey there by you once I've enjoyed your company for a while. At present, however, I'm going to Jerusalem, bringing aid to the saints. For Macedonia and Achaia have been pleased to make some contribution for the poor among the saints at Jerusalem. They were pleased to do it, and indeed they owe it to them. For if the Gentiles have come to share in their spiritual blessings, they they ought also to be of service to them in material blessings. Paul's saying, look at Gentiles who are getting saved are getting saved because salvation came through Judaism. It came through the Jews. So we are being blessed by all the, the Jews went through and that Messiah came through Israel. And so we, and Paul's putting it in kind of a way that we owe them at least some benevolence back. So there are poor people who have accepted Messiah And they're outcasts. Many of them have been cast out of their synagogues in Jerusalem because they trust in Jesus and claim Him as Lord. And so many of the Jews are saying, you you know, you've turned on us following after this Jesus guy. You have to go. So many Jews were very poor and in bad situation in Jerusalem. So Paul is appealing to the Gentiles saying, hey, look, can you raise some money? Can we get some funds? And can we bring it back to the Jews in Jerusalem? We basically owe them. You know, they brought Messiah and salvation through. And and so you're benefiting from this gospel message. Can you give us some cash to bring back to them? And they did. The offerings were tremendous. In 2 Corinthians, Paul talks about how abundantly they gave. And so he says, so that's what I'm on a service to do. Uh, And he says in verse 28, When therefore I have completed this and have delivered to them what's been collected, I'll leave for Spain by way of you, Rome. I know that when I come to you, I will come in the fullness of the blessings of Christ. So I appeal to you, brothers, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit to strive together with me in your prayers to God on my behalf that I may be delivered from the unbelievers in Judea and that my service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints, so that by God's will I may come to you with joy and be refreshed in your company. May the God of peace be with you all. Amen. Paul wants to get through all these trials and troubles so that he can make it to Rome. And uh, we can read the rest of that story in the book of Acts. So you hear Paul's heart of what's going on. Now we we come to chapter 16, and he's basically wanting to greet everybody in Rome. Now he's never been there, but there are obviously people there that he has come to know and have ministered with and spent time in jail with as he was persecuted, people that have come into uh, Jerusalem and back to Rome. Uh, uh, You know, obviously it was the center of the Roman Empire, so people were always moving in and out of there, coming back into Jerusalem, especially the Jews who would live there would come three times a year to Jerusalem and come back again. So Paul knew many of the people, but he's writing to a congregation he's never been at. And in the closing of his letter, right, remember we talked about this, It's, it's an amazing legal treatise of how to be saved, what salvation is, what our inheritance is in salvation, how to get along as believers, how to work together. And now he's closing it up and greeting everybody in love. And he says this in chapter 16. I'm going to take you through, and we're going to go through this list of people, but what I want you to see in this list is something really extraordinary. Because what you find are Gentiles and Jews slaves and free, women and men, wealthy people and poor people, and people of all ethnicity, ordinary and important. But he calls them all brothers and sisters. They're all one in Christ. 
And so as Paul was preaching and how to get along, and Paul is preaching on what the gospel declares, in his closing statement when he's talking to his friends, you can tell this guy is living what he preached. How many of you remember when Peter was uh, persuaded by the Judaizers to the peer pressure, he stepped away from the Gentiles at a, at a meeting they were at. And so Peter's hanging out with the Gentiles. He's trying to get used to this, right? He spoke at Cornelius' house. They got saved. He was at the Tanner's house, and, and he was down in Samaria. And, and now he's meeting with some Gentiles, and then a, a large Jewish contingency walks into the room, and Peter separates from the Gentiles. Paul sees it, and Paul describes this in the book of Galatians. Paul sees it and comes face to face with Peter and rebukes him. And, uh, you know, says, what are you doing? And so if we're going to say that we as Christians love everybody as God loves, it better show up. Remember, we've been talking about this. There's no prejudice in the body of Christ. None. No room for it. Okay? All nations, all tribes, all tongues, all people. Jesus died for everyone. So we can't segregate. We can't be prejudiced. We can't separate by class. James talks about it. Don't put your rich people down front. Don't cater to the rich or the poor. There is no rich and poor. We are all in Christ Jesus. There is no slave or free. We're all. What he says about slave and free is he says the slave is God's freed man. And the free man is God's slave. So you see, Christianity messes with the entire world system. And so it better show up. And that's what I want you to see in chapter 16 with Paul. These are all his brothers and sisters. He counts them all as important. And they all have something to offer to him. So let's take a look at it. First he starts this. I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a servant of the church at, uh, what is that, Chenkreia, that you may welcome her in the Lord in a way worthy of the saints and help her in whatever she may need from you, for she has been a patron of many of myself as well. Now, Phoebe, that's a, Phoebe is a Greek name. It's, it's the name after the moon. You know, uh, and uh, so bright illuminated one, that's what the name means. But what he says about Phoebe, and this is the English standard translation, the word for her as a uh, servant of the church is diakonos. You know what word we get from diakonos, don't you, in the Greek? A deacon. She's a deacon in the church, a deaconess. So Phoebe has position in the church. She's a servant. That's what a deacon means. So she's a servant, and many believe that it was Phoebe who was, in fact, the one who brought this letter uh, of Romans to the church at Rome. That's why he's saying, welcome her. She's a servant of the body of Christ, She's, and which is really interesting. So there's a debate among theologians that it might well be, because remember, the people were illiterate. You know, Phoebe didn't get there and say, like, where's your Xerox machine? Because I, I need to run this off, or, or let's get, you know, about 100 books made of this. Nobody could read. Most of the people there could not read. Maybe in Rome, a few more, because it's a, a high-class city. But so typically the person who would bring the book, especially if they were an assistant to the one who wrote it, was the lectionary, was the one who read the book. Because it was very important, if you've ever seen Greek, if you've ever seen how these things were written, there's no sentence structure, there's no punctuation. It's all capital letters running right together. I don't know, and and that is almost impossible to read. So you don't know when a phrase starts, when it stops, exclamation points, commas. So you really have to know how to read this thing. And so they believe that quite possibly Phoebe was the one who delivered Paul's message to the congregation, not just delivered. We're thinking she showed up with a scroll and said, here. What he's saying is she delivered the message. Now that messes with some theology, doesn't it? That messes with some folks who say women should be silent in the church. Wait a minute, I thought Paul said that. But there's a contextual reason for him saying that. He says that they should remain silent in the church and ask their questions of their husbands when they get home. 
The problem that was going on in that context in Corinthians is you've got a mix now of women coming into church with men and asking questions and disrupting the service to find out answers. He's saying, keep it down. Let the person talk. Because women can prophesy in church. Philip had four prophetess daughters. So they can speak and they can exhort. So it's a debate, but many people think that quite possibly Phoebe delivered this message of the book of Romans to the church at Rome because she understood what Paul was trying to get across. And she could explain it through reading the scroll and teach it to them. And uh, that's a pretty important position, wouldn't you say, for women in the church? And the person that started that, of course, is Jesus. Who were the first witnesses at the tomb of Jesus' resurrection? Women. Women didn't have a say in court. If you're going to fabricate a religion, the last thing you would do is put someone who couldn't be a witness in court as a witness to the resurrection. Right? You see what I'm saying? And, and so Jesus often had women that were very important to the ministry, and he elevated the place of women. Judaism kept them aside, but Christianity raises women to be equal in salvation, co-heirs in salvation. There's neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male or female in Christ. It's an amazing thing. And so he says, I commend to you this deaconess, Phoebe, uh, a servant of the church, and he says this, welcome her in the Lord in a worthy way of the saints, help her in whatever she may need, all right, he's telling her this person's important, and then he says this, she has been a patron of many and myself as well. She's a benefactor, she was probably wealthy. She probably funded some of Paul's missionary journeys. And so this Phoebe was someone who was a servant to the church and yet had finance that continually helped a number of the apostles and evangelists and preachers in the church. And Paul said, I'm a recipient of her good care. So take care of her. It's quite a commendation for this woman, isn't it? All right. Doesn't mention a husband, doesn't mention anything else. Single lady doing the work of the Lord and, and uh, being used of God. Let's go on. And then he says this, Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, who risk their necks for my life, to whom not only I give thanks, but all the churches of the Gentiles give thanks and well as well. So if you'll remember the book of Acts, Priscilla and Aquila, it's an interesting statement. When you first meet Aquila and Priscilla, you first meet Aquila. You're introduced by, to the husband. This is Aquila and Priscilla. Eloquent in speech, heard Paul, trained him up, helped them. And then from then on, every reference you hear in the book of Acts, the names are flipped and you hear of Priscilla and Aquila. Priscilla and Aquila. Well, as, as naming goes, if you're going to put a, a name on the, on the marquee, <laughs> if you will, not like the early church had signs like that, but I'm just saying, usually put the prominent one first. And here we have another example of a woman who is married under the authority of her husband, as Scripture says, but yet she seems to be the key teacher in this couple. Dynamic duo. They also, Aquila and Priscilla, also uh, trained up Apollos, Apollos was an eloquent speecher, really an amazing orator. Uh, there was a whole profession in, in Rome and, and in Greece on being orators. Again, it was an oral culture, okay? So their performances and their readings and everything was done by an orator and people who were eloquent and, and knew how to dramatically present a word. And Apollos was that, but he was a little lack on theology and Aquila and Priscilla helped him and so he even says that everybody in the church of all the gentiles were really blessed by this couple and i know they're at rome now tell them i said hi love you guys you're awesome man you saved me i don't know how many times that's awesome he goes on and he says this uh greet also the church in their house so they had a house church in Rome, right? So they moved to Rome, 
And so uh, they're starting to gather people in their homes and teach them and instruct them and disciple them. He goes on, he says, Greet my beloved Apinaeus, Apinetus, Apinetus, who was the first convert to Christ in Asia. It's almost like, like Rome is where everybody's headed, you know? Everybody's kind of gathering at Rome. And here's one of the first converts. Paul's remembering. Could you imagine that? Could you imagine say, hey, hey, listen, oh yeah, I can't wait to, to get over to see you in Port Huron, and I hear that John's there. He was the first guy that was ever saved in Detroit, man, that's awesome. Tell him I said hi. What a, what a testimony. First guy to get saved in a, in a whole region. And, and he, Paul remembers his name. It, first convert in Christ in Asia. Right? Asia. We're not talking about uh, first convert to Christ in Roseville. Asia. That's the dude. <laughs> That's so cool. And he remembers him. Greet Mary. I love this. Greet Mary, who has worked hard for you. Do you know how many Mariams or Marys there must have been in there? <laughs> but there's this one. She knows who I'm talking about, too. Because we got this thing. Mary's awesome, man. She just shows up all the time. She works. And you know how blessed we are because of Mary. Tell her I said hi, okay? This is just really personal. And what you'll find out over and over, 11 times he calls these people in the Lord, and he uses the terms, my beloved, uh, my uh, co-worker. Uh, uh, and so he's endeared to these people. Verse 7, Great, uh, greet Andronicus and Junia, my kinsmen and my fellow prisoners. So here's two Jewish people. That's what he means by kinsmen. So he says, yeah, greet these two Jewish folks. They're my kinsmen. And uh, my fellow prisoners. So do you remember like when we were in prison together, when we got whipped and beaten for preaching the gospel? Remember how we kind of sang to each other and helped each other? I mean, you bond pretty good in, in prison. You do. Really care about each other. You're going through the troubles. And so that's pretty cool. Greet Adronicus and Junia, my kinsmen and my fellow prisoners. They are well known to the apostles, and they were in Christ before I was. They got saved before I did. That's cool. Now, here's an interesting thing. Again, the ESV here says they are well known to the apostles. That's a newer rendering. The traditional rendering is this, that they are outstanding among the apostles. What would, how would that make a difference in statement? If I were to tell you this person is known to the apostles, or if I told you this person is outstanding among the apostles, what's the difference? Yeah, you would think that they were of the apostles. Among the apostles, they're outstanding. Which is how most commentators see it and read it in the Greek, not that just they were famous to the apostles, but they're outstanding among the apostles, which is really fascinating, and again, it causes a problem for some because Junia is a female name. Therefore, we now have Junia, the apostle. So again, what are we going to do with women? <laughs> Whatever they want. <laughs> That's how you get along. Anyways, all right. Junia, could she be an apostle? Can the fivefold ministry operate within women? Most definitely. Remember, we've talked about fivefold before. Fivefold is the DNA of Jesus. It's the, he is the apostle, the prophet, the pastor, the evangelist, the teacher. He is each of those. It, and these five attributes and traits or gifts or charises, graces, are in fact what give us the DNA of Jesus himself. Otherwise, how would those five given to the body cause us to grow up into the stature of Jesus? So these fivefold make us become like Jesus, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. So they are within everyone who has the Spirit of God within them. So the spirit of Jesus is within us. We have his DNA. So each one of us is going to have a characteristic of that fivefold. 
So of course women are going to be apostolic or prophetic or evangelistic or pastoral, right? Or teaching. It, what we've done with it through church history is we've made them offices of authority and regulated them to a few. And I just don't think you can do that with that fivefold because now you've just you've eliminated what does the rest of the body do? Right? If there's just certain fivefold people, then what are you? What's everybody else? Oh, we're just followers of Jesus. And someday we'll see those apostles. Maybe they'll visit our town someday. You know, it's like, come on. We are the fivefold ministry. In every church and every gathering of people, the body of Christ is represented. And so, as I've been teaching you, you move in apostolic, or you'll move in prophetic, or you'll move towards the teaching. And that characteristic of Jesus is in you. So yes, men and women can both be within a fivefold ministry. The only restrictions we see in scripture is that of the top tier leadership of eldership that is to be reserved for male because that's the the creation ordinance and and it is that where uh, man is the head of the wife in the home so as Christ is the head of the man. It puts an order for for family life and structure. And so, as I understand Scripture, women are free to minister as freely and so forth, but when it comes to top leadership, it should be male so that it reflects in our homes the male leadership and the creation order that God made. But that leaves a lot of room, as we see here in Scripture, for women to minister. As we see Phoebe, as we see Junus, Junia. Now we go on. Verse 8, greet Ampliatus, my beloved in the Lord. Everybody's his beloved. Greet Urbanus, our fellow worker in Christ, and my beloved Stachys. Greet Apelles, who is approved in Christ. Uh, approved of Christ, he's been uh, like tempered. He's he's shown himself faithful. Greet those who belong to the family of Aristobulus. This is an interesting because this is the family of Aristobulus. Now, Aristobulus was the grandson, grandson of Herod the Great and was a close friend of the emperor Claudius. Okay, so his family gets saved and he's the great-grandson, so he was obviously aristocracy. He obviously had wealth and finance and maybe some political connections and got saved. The grandson, he got saved, and so his family is now serving Jesus. Can rich people get saved? Okay, okay. Can people who have political positions get saved? Can, can politicians get saved? Oh, okay. All right. We'll pray for them. He says, say hi to that household. Then he goes on, he says, greet my kinsman, another Jew, Herodian. Now Herodian was a Jewish slave who was a part of that larger household of Aristobulus, now in the emperor's service. So people have an in politically and in the government. Greet those in the Lord who belong to the family of Narcissus. Uh... When Nero came to the throne, his mother Agrippini forced Narcissus to commit suicide. So three or four years before the Romans were, uh, this book was written, this guy Narcissus had to commit suicide. So the family of Narcissus are saved. They're part of a royal household, probably his slaves as well. So he says the family of Narcissus because Narcissus is dead. Again, just different. The reason I'm pointing this out is because it's different social structures. Greet the workers in the Lord, Tryphania and Tryphosa. They think they're twins. Greet the beloved Persis who has worked hard in the Lord. This is a good one. Greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord, also his mother, who has been a mother to me as well. Uh, this year I did a Mother's Day message on this passage, and uh, it was fascinating. 
So this Rufus is from Cyrene, okay? And he is the son of Simon of Cyrene. Does anybody remember that name and who that guy was? Who? He carried Jesus' cross. He was with his two boys, Luke tells us, and one of those boys' names was Rufus. So here you have the little boy who is coming to Jerusalem with his father from Cyrene. Now, Cyrene is in northern Africa, okay, modern Libya. So he's, he's come from Africa to Jerusalem with his two boys to go to Passover. And as he's coming to Passover, Simon's standing there, and there's a commotion in the crowd. Everybody's yelling and screaming. And next thing as they're looking, Simon gets a hand pulled on him. He's yanked from his two boys, pulled in, and commanded to carry this guy's cross that's laying on the ground. Who's that? Jesus. Simon carries that cross, has to leave his boys, and carries this cross of Jesus to Golgotha. Tradition tells us Simon is, gets saved. He obviously carries the faith to his son and to his mother. All right? Where do they end up? In Rome. Rufus, the son, is with his mother in Rome, but somewhere along the road, some way, Simon's wife, Rufus's mother, becomes a mother to Paul. Isn't that wild? And so Paul has this woman that tends to him, cares for him, ministers to him, and probably could tell him the story that her husband told her of how he carried the cross for Jesus. And I'm sure Rufus knows that story well. There's another famous person that came from uh, uh, Cyrene. His name was John Mark. John Mark and his mother came from northern Africa, transported to Jerusalem. So there was a contingency of Jews that were living in Cyrene, northern Africa, and came to Jerusalem, and impacted by, obviously, Simon, who carried the cross of Jesus. They come back to Jerusalem. John Mark comes back with his mom. And uh, it's his mother's house that somebody spends a night there and has a meal. Does anybody remember that? Jesus had the Last Supper at Mark's mother's house, Mary. So you have this African connection to the gospel. And, and so Mark, they believe, is the little boy in the book of Mark that when Jesus goes to the, to the garden... And the Roman soldiers come, it says just out of the blue this weird story of a little boy where they grab his cloak and he he gets out of it and runs away naked. Only Mark puts that story in there. And so they believe that was Mark as a little boy. John Mark, here you have Paul who's being ministered to and, and strengthened by Rufus's mother, from Cyrene, Mark is Barnabas' nephew, who is Paul's partner, who brings Mark along with them on these missionary journeys. You see, all these, all of a sudden the world gets a little smaller because there's all these connections with these people. Mark abandons Paul, but later on, Paul says, send Mark to me. He's profitable to me. Mark grows up and does a little better with it. Now, what's not in our Bibles, but in history books, is Mark It becomes the scribe for the apostle Peter. And he writes down all of what Peter taught and preached, and it becomes the gospel of Mark. Mark does this in Rome probably hanging out with Rufus and his mother, who's from Cyrene, because he's from there. Mark then, according to church tradition, goes back to Cyrene and begins preaching and brings the gospel to northern Africa and brings a a, a revival into Alexandria, and the major uh, 
emphasis of Christianity in, in the beginning of, of Christianity is in Africa, northern Africa. Because a man carried the cross of Jesus and influenced another young man who wrote the gospel of Mark. So you don't know who you're going to bump into when you're walking down the road. But I want you to know who you meet and who you connect with. There are going to be connections throughout your life that, that it's going to impact. I had breakfast today with a guy I knew in high school that uh, I met at a soup kitchen and that has come back to the Lord. And we have this instant bond because I knew him when he was in high school. You see what I'm saying? How many of you have relationship with friends and people that they'll come back into your life? There's going to be testimony of all these different connections. All right, I got sidetracked, but I just found that fascinating. There's a lot behind these stories. All right? Where are we at? We're at Rufus. 14, greet Asinicritus, Phlegon, Hermes, Petrobus, Hermas, and the brothers who are with them. All right, we got a little gang here. We got a little, tell the boys I say hi. So that's that group of guys. Then he says this, greet Philogus, Julia, Nerus, and his sister, and Olympus, and all the saints that are with them. And the girls club too. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the churches of Christ greet you. So he calls them all beloved. He calls them love. Now, I can't help it, but I have to tell this story only because it's funny. Greet with a holy kiss. Do you know what a holy kiss is? Learn what a holy kiss is. Okay, it's not on the lips. It's a respectful kiss on a cheek. Okay? It's one of those type things. (laughs) And uh, you greet with a holy kiss. It's a sign of respect and honor. All right? An American thing is hugging. People in other countries and other lands don't hug like that. So it's really like, whoa, 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 whoa. Um, but you may give a holy kiss. And, and the reason I want to tell this story is because it's really funny because where I went to church uh, with my wife when we were young, uh, there was a guy there named Donnie, and Donnie was really into the holy kiss. Whenever he met you, he gave you a holy kiss. And Don was one of those guys that had whiskers to his eyeballs, a really coarse beard, like 80 grit, and never shaved, and like he had this really, and he always wanted to give you a holy kiss, and it was like, ow, oh, Donnie, come on. And, and so, I love the brother, great guy. It's just, so one day we were at Eastland Mall, Christmas time, and we saw Donnie, and it was like, oh, there's Donnie, oh, there's Donnie. <laughs> and Donnie had a pretzel with mustard all over it. Donnie's eating a pretzel, chewing on it. He goes, hey, brother Tim! And there's mustard all over Donnie. And he comes up and he, no, Donnie, no, no, not. Oh! I got the holy kiss with mustard on it. Just thought I'd share that because when you give the, you know, there might be people who don't want a holy kiss. So extend a hand first. Now he goes on and he says this, I appeal to you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause divisions and create obstacles contrary to the doctrine that you have been taught. Isn't it interesting that Paul is saying, say hi to this person, my beloved. Say hi to that person, what a great worker. And say hi to this person, they, man, they rescued me. They're awesome. He's saying hi, hi, hi to all these people. They're, they're, they're Jews, they're Gentiles, they're women, they're men, they're slaves, they're free. They're all his crowd. We all have a crowd. We're a really mixed group of people. But we all love Jesus. That's what binds us together. And he says, you know what? If there's someone who's causing division you got to mark them. That's causing a problem in the body of Christ. We can't have that, so please watch that. And then when they come against doctrine, pay attention. For such persons do not serve our Lord Jesus, but their own appetites. And by smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the hearts of the naive. Again, there's a father talking. 
He wants to keep the family together. For your obedience is known to all, so that I rejoice over you. But I want you to be wise as to what is good and innocent of evil. Boy, isn't that a good statement. He says, be wise in what is good, be knowledgeable in what is good, but innocent of evil. Sounds like the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Be wise in what is good, know goodness, know what is good. But why does he change it to innocent instead of not knowing? Be innocent of evil. What do you think that means, be innocent of evil? haven't done any evil. You're not doing any evil. Uh, I'm not guilty of evil, right? So I am innocent of evil. And there are, in fact, uh, it's also to be good, ignorant of some levels of evil, right? There's a lot of evil out in the world that I I don't even know about. And you know what? I don't want to know. But we live in a society and in a culture that's constantly trying to show evil, show evil, entertain us by evil. Do you know our entertainment is evil? And show movies of evil. You know, these movies, I think it's Saw, these movies that put people in torture situations where they're mutilating themselves. That's our entertainment? Why are we watching this? I need to be innocent, innocent of this evil. I don't want to see this stuff. I don't want to hear about it. I don't want to begin thinking about it. But you know what? Our, our, that, that part of us of our flesh is titillated by it. So we've got to be very careful of it. So he says, be knowledgeable of what's good, innocent of evil, and the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. Man, I love that statement. That's a promise of Paul to the church at Romans. What's he saying is going to happen in the Roman church? You're going, to put sat- you're going to crush Satan under your feet. Is that something that can happen over and over? You can do this over and over, folks. It didn't just happen to the Romans. It's a good prayer to pray. I pray that you crush Satan under your feet. Because where do enemies belong? Under our feet. And in, in the Eastern culture, that's exactly where they put them. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Timothy, my fellow worker, greets you. So do Lucius and Jasus and Sassipater, my kinsmen. I, Tertius, who wrote this letter, greet you in the Lord. Wait a minute, I thought Paul wrote this. Who's this guy? Tertius. Who? There you go. He's the secretary doing the writing, just like Mark was to Peter. So he's writing it out, and he's saying, hey, Paul, is right if I put this in there? Maybe he didn't even ask. I'm just putting it in there. (laughs) So I'm saying hi to you guys. Gaius, who is host to me and to the whole church, greets you. Now, he's the host of the whole church in Corinth, so I don't know who he is. Erastus, the city treasurer, and our brother Cordus greet you. Now, you've got the city treasurer of Corinth. So this guy has to be a big political muckety-muck. He's the city treasurer in Corinth. Corinth is a big Greek city. And he's the treasurer hanging out in this church. What's really interested is Paul puts him with the brother Quartus. Now why would he put... Because what's interesting is Quartus is not a name, it's a number. You see, Teratus is number three. Quartus is number four. That's what those terms mean. These guys don't even have names. They got numbers. So most likely they were slaves. Slave number one, slave number two, slave number three, slave number four. And what I find fascinating is as he's wrapping this up, he says, oh yeah, and then the city treasurer's here. He says, hi, and so is my brother the slave. Right? Isn't this cool? Is it all right if we... I remember Vic Walkenhorse. Again, church I grew up in. His wife was the head of the tape ministry and all sorts of things, super active in the church. And Vic would help with setting up chairs and tables. Always dressed sharp. 
But he was this guy that was just like always there to move tables, help chairs, sweep the floor. It was like, Vic's a great guy. What a nice guy. He always does all this menial task stuff. That's really neat. I thought, that's nice. You know, Vic's cool. What a humble guy. And then I found out from a couple of my friends who worked at GM that Vic Walkenhorse was the head of General Motors architectural firms. It's like, who? Vic? See, if I wouldn't have no, it, I had no idea of Vic outside the church. If I would have seen Vic outside the church, I would have said, excuse me, sir, pardon me, sir, I don't know if I'd talk to the guy, because this dude was way up there in authority at General Motors. But in our church, it's just Vic. Set up tables and move chairs. You see, in the body of Christ, we're just Tim and Bob and Cindy and Lou, you know? That's, that's who we are. The authority and respect we give to each other is spiritually. But we can have a president here and we can have a slave. We can have a prisoner here. We can have, it doesn't matter. Because in Christ, we're all the beloved. Amen? Let's conclude. I finish with this doxology. Now to him who's able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages, but has now been disclosed and through the prophetic writings has been made known to all nations according to the command of the eternal God to bring about the obedience of faith to the only wise God be glory forever through Jesus Christ. Amen. He summarizes the entire theology of the book of Romans in his last statement. God, who had held this mystery of the Messiah for all ages, now has revealed him so that salvation can come to all nations, so that we can bring people to faith in Christ Jesus. Be glory to God for that gospel message. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Jesus, it is only through a right understanding of who you are and who we are, that we can walk in humility and salvation one with another. God, would you bless our hearts to respect each other and love each other as fellow heirs of salvation. There is no one more important in this room than another, no one less than another but all equally saved by the blood of Jesus and all do the love and respect of each other. May that unity be birthed and practiced in this church. In Jesus' name, amen.